So immediately from this moment of feeling like, wow, we really built this great you know, service and product that people love, to, oh my God, like 30 days, we're gonna be out of business. The highs in entrepreneurship, very high. The lows, very low. And the delta in time between the two can be surprisingly short. Two days, two days, yeah. this, maybe three days. I think people think that the, you know, the path is like, oh, you just raise an A, you raise a B, it's super easy. And, you know, you go from 25 to 100 to a billion and you go public. Like, that's not really how it goes in entrepreneurship. And people should talk about that one. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Rex, the founder of Cambrian, a community for founders and builders in fintech. Um, I'm incredibly excited for today's program. We're going to be diving into the backstory of Credit Karma. It's one of the most recognizable names in all of fintech. 110 million consumers use Credit Karma to understand their credit scores and get access uh, to some of the best financial products that are tailored specifically to them. And then for investors, the $8 billion sale to Intuit in 2020 was one of the largest exits uh, in fintech history and kind of proved out that fintech was a very material uh, category. But uh, if you think back over Credit Karma's history, which is now 15 years in the making and think that building this company was easy, spoiler, <laughs> it wasn't. So today we're going to cover both the highs and the lows of what it took to build uh, Credit Karma, everything from launching in 2007 during the Great Recession to navigating the sale more recently in 2020 at the onset of the COVID pandemic. And of course, to guide us through that journey, we have none other than Ken Lind, who is the founder and CEO of Credit Karma. So Ken, welcome to the program. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. This is going to be fun. No, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. So first, set the scene for me. Um, talk to me about how you came up with the idea, which was, as you put it to me yesterday, the first idea that none of your friends hated. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I've always been a little bit of a serial entrepreneur. And uh, back in 2006 or so, I was running my own marketing agency. And and I was really searching for something that was going to be more scalable, more interesting than the marketing agency that I'd created. And um, a couple of things that happened along the way. And you know, I think one is I realized that credit scores were really important. Uh, you know, credit scores are really a defining metric of your financial life. But every financial services company, every credit grantor, every uh, subscription service, whether that be Comcast, and there would be Netflix, they actually kind of care about your credit score because it gives you a sense of who's going to pay, but also the longevity of that customer. So the idea of Credit Karma really formed in that context of, hey, people really want it. I think we can give it away for free. And I think it'll help consumers find the right financial products based on that information. So I shopped it around to a bunch of friends and I always kind of tell the story that I always found the most useful feedback were not the friends who were just telling me that, you know, it was the best idea and I should do it. It was always the ones that kicked the tires, right? It's the, always the ones that pushed I'm like, did you think about this? And what about from a regulatory perspective? And how much is a credit score going to cost? Let me take a look at the model. And, you know, it's through those that the, the learnings really get fleshed out and the ones that push you to, you know, think bigger. But that was the context of the founding of Credit Karma was a lot of times in Starbucks. And to your point, it was the first uh, first idea that my friends didn't, you know, universally say this is terrible. <laughs> yeah. And it's kind of crazy that, you know, back then, uh, one of the most important numbers in your financial life was basically opaque or unattainable until it was too late. You know, you got denied from a loan for a house, for a car. Love to fast forward a little bit. 2009, world's falling apart, post grace recession. You've actually already raised your first kind of initial bit of money from the CEO of e eLoan, but you're going out um, for your, your Series A. FinTech is at this point, you know, about a decade away from even being considered a category. Um, so tell us about your experience doing that kind of first major raise. I'd raised an angel amount, a few hundred thousand dollars. And, you know, things were going up and to the right and, and you felt like you had the momentum and, you know, we had the user base. So we, we felt like we were on the right trajectory. And I think like many entrepreneurs and, you know, to quote Mike Tyson, everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face. But well, we had a plan, right? We we're going to go over as our series A and then you get punched in the face with the Great Recession. And uh, but we were Basically, catering our revenue stream was going to come from financial services companies. And at that point in time, um, it was unclear as to which financial services companies would survive. 
So with that as backdrop, you know, what we thought was going to be a relatively easy fundraise turned into a nearly impossible fundraise. And, you know, maybe a couple of war stories here was, you know, I probably pitched a um, hundred companies in that time period. And, you know, they were all like, yeah, interesting idea. But there's no way we're funding this in the context yep. uh, of the Great Recession. But two, you know, two interesting stories. I, I think one specifically was, when we were down and out, you know, we did get one term sheet and, you know, just a rough order of magnitude. I think we wanted a $10 million pre, which is like, you know. And, and for context, you, you guys pay. had, you had real, you know, metrics. You had 100,000 users, I think, at the time. We're doing about 20,000 yeah. in, in monthly revenue. Yeah, exactly. We had, you know, we had real metrics. We had real users. Uh, and, and I thought it was a reasonable type of expectation from a fundraise. But in the backdrop of the environment, you know, there was, it was not happening. But I remember we got one term sheet and uh, it was the only term sheet that we had. And, you know, I wanted 10, they offered like four, you know, I wanted to raise like a million. They wanted uh, me to take two and a half. But if you do the math on what, you know, two and a half million dollars on a $4 million valuation means, it means you're basically giving up a whole bunch of equity on dilution you're not really a founder anymore. You're more of an employee of a of a firm. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. you're absolutely right. And I think in that context, you now I think they they wrote the offer because they could. And then in their and to their credit, there's probably a bunch of uncertainty, so they're taking a gamble on it. Um, and I remember that being one of the hardest decisions because we ultimately decided not to take that, and it really meant that we were out of money. And I remember, it, uh, like I, you know, I scraped together like the last seventy five thousand dollars that I had, wrote it back into the company, and just said, "Well, this is it. We're not going to make payroll in a few more of these." Did Did you miss any payrolls, or did you? We've never missed a payroll. Luckily, uh, I've always kind of found a way. But you know, I've been I, in I companies that have missed payroll before, and it, it uh, certainly well, happens. Yeah, I think people don't write about that enough. I think people think that the you know the path is like oh you just raise an A, you raise a B, it's super easy, and you know you go from twenty five to a hundred to a billion, and you go public. Like that's not really how it goes in entrepreneurship, and people should talk about that more. So that was a really hard decision for us as a team. I remember I, I took it to our co-founders. I said I don't think it's a good offer. I think we shouldn't do it. I'll do everything I can to go and figure out how to make this happen. So we we scraped together a few more dollars along the way. You know, somebody introduced us to QED and and you know, back then fintech wasn't a thing. And I don't think QED was a thing in the sense that, you know, they probably funded two or three companies before us. Yep. Yeah. They were they were just getting started. It was, you know, Nigel who'd founded one of the only banks to be founded in God knows how long, taking a bet on a category that didn't really exist. Um, so yeah, an interesting firm at, at the time. And you've gotten a lot of no's from people on Sand Hill Road, but then took a red eye back to the, the East Coast. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, somebody made an introduction and for anyone who doesn't know QED or Nigel, Nigel co-founded Capital One and uh, he spun out of there and really created a venture firm focused on fintech. Um, and, you know, that was an interesting intro, sent them the deck. They said, well, we'd love to meet you, you know, took a red eye out. Um, got there, met with Nigel, Frank, Caribou in the morning. And I think we pitched at 10 o'clock. We were probably done by, you know, 1130. I was at the airport probably like, you know, three o'clock taking a flight back to San Francisco. And what I thought was really cool about that was I think by the time that I landed back in San Francisco that night, we actually had an offer that, you know, they knew what I really wanted, which was that $10 million. That $10 million mattered because it meant it was you know, at least on par with, you know, some of the, fun, you know, friends and family writing checks. It was really interesting to me in terms of how quickly they got it relative to people who don't understand the space, right? I mean, here was a bunch of him and Han from 100 VCs over that duration of people who didn't want to, you know, get involved. And then here we are, somebody who could turn around a term sheet and matter. And I guess my point here is, you know, the, the people who get it will really get it. I, I don't think that, you know, you get that much more clarity on thinking about a deal for an extra two or three weeks. Um, but sometimes you really know um, from investors who understand the space. Yeah. And when you're pioneering a new category, it's really hard because there is no category of investor to go out to. There's no like list of top fintech investors before fintech, which means there isn't this kind of depth of expertise. So you have this double challenge of, you know, incredibly challenging environment, kind of pioneering a new category and having to find kind of the, the first believers. Yeah, that's exactly right. Just to, just to double click on that point, right? And 
I think the key here was the ca- the export here, right? Like, you know, the brand names of venture didn't matter. What mattered was actually, um, you know, the you know the investment partner having expertise in the space. That's what made the difference. What do you think were kind of the core things that they understood or, or got that maybe other people didn't understand as well? Yeah, I think they understood the the value of credit, right? And if you're a VC, right, like you just apply for a credit card and you get it, right? Like, <laughs> what's the big deal, right? Yeah, I don't think they're nest- sitting in your like mail all the time. Yeah, so I don't think they're yeah. exposed to the problems of the you know of the ninety five percent, and I think that was one of the challenges that we had in the space. And I think that was something that you know Nigel and Frank and team were uniquely qualified, right? They started you know Capital One, and you know they focus on helping you know the underserved and the people who don't have great credit. So this was something that was directly in their wheelhouse, and they got it immediately. Yep. Totally. Yeah. And they're, the Capital One's initial card programs, a lot of them focused on folks who like this was their first credit card. So they spent a lot of time in that, that area. Cool. I want to fast forward a little bit. So kind of 2011, you know, you've raised your Series A. Things are still going pretty well. You're growing. You need to grow faster. And you kind of stumble into this really surprising area of growth, which has to do with remnant media, which kinks the growth, growth curve. So tell me a little bit about that story. So we'd raised the money from uh, QED, I want to say 2008, 2009. And then for the focus for the next year or two was unit economics, right? So we wanted to make sure that for every dollar we put into the system, we could, you know, roughly get a dollar out of the system. And over the course of that year, year and a half, we actually got there. So we felt pretty good. We were like, hey, for every user we get, we're not really making any money, but it's working. We're breaking even. And that's a pretty important milestone. So the next endeavor was actually how do we grow? And if you recall, my, you know, my prior business was really in digital, so a marketing agency. So I was pretty good at search, pretty good at display. The challenge on those front is that you know when somebody's making two hundred dollars per user and you're making a dollar a user, like you can't compete on AdWords, you can't compete on display. So we really yep. thought about you know what can we do it. And and, and in that prior life of mine, I'd worked with a major ad agency and I called up one of their partners and said, hey, it's Ken, remember me? I'm running this little company called Credit Karma now. And we're interested in, you know, understanding television. What should we do? What can we do? And, you know, he said to me, Ken, well, you know, it's probably going to cost you about, you know, two, three hundred thousand dollars to shoot a commercial. You're probably going to need about half a million dollars worth of inventory. And then and only then you might get a read on whether or not it's going to yep. work. Now, we probably had about a million dollars. in So a million dollars right? just to test the waters is basically yeah. what he's so telling Almost a yeah. million dollars to yeah. test the water. Basically everything that we had in the bank. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make a bunch of sense. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, being a little bit of a scrappy startup that we are and wanting to test everything, what we did was um, we took my DSLR, we took uh, two employees, uh, we bought maybe $30 in props, we rented a sound studio, we shot our own commercial. I think we spent about $300 all in between yep. the props, the sound studio and all of that. And the and, voice uh, actor from Craigslist. Yeah, and a voice actor, and we we, <laughs> we shot a commercial, and uh, I didn't really think much of it. Um, you know, I knew we had it in the can, so to speak, and I just kind of let the team run with it. Um, you know, moved on. There's a lot that you're doing, so you don't think too much of it. But back then, we used to have this uh, email called uh, the Good Hour email, and you would get this email every time it hit a certain threshold. Um, and I think the threshold at the time was like, you know, 100 registrations within the hour. And what happened was I got one of these good hour emails in the middle of the night. And I was like, well, that's really weird. Like, you know, you don't get 100 users in the middle of the night. <laughs> what the hell is going on? So but whatever, it's the middle of the night. I don't think anything of it. Random things happen all the time, right? But then the next day, the same exact, you know, exact thing happens at the same hour. So now I'm like, this is really weird. So I, I call up Greg, who is uh, running our marketing programs. I'm like, hey, Greg, what's going on with these emails? And he's like, well, I didn't want to call you on this yet because I'm still trying to figure it out. But he said, I think it was television. I was like, huh, you know, the commercial that we shot for $300, that drove the good hour email? 
And then the key question here is, well, how much did you spend, right? Because yeah, yeah. it might be fine to drive 100 registrations, but you know, you spent $100,000 on it. It's not really performant. And he's like, I think we spent like 75 bucks, right? And yeah. I'm doing the math. I'm like, 75 bucks, 100 users, like that's less than a dollar per user. Um, and that's the beginning of how we figured out remnant inventory. So we're buying inventory in the middle of the night. There'd be like these little, you know, so like some, some area around Cincinnati, 1.30 in the morning, excess ad inventory on TV, boom, yep. up pops the credit card ad that yep. you bought that space for like 50 bucks, right? That's right. And, yeah. and, you know, and we got results immediately, like literally triggered our good hour email. And we were really on to something. And, you know, it was, it was interesting, right? Because like, one, I think we were using Spot Runner, which was one of these. And we ultimately ended using Google uh, Television Auction. And I think we were probably one of their biggest customers. But literally over a course of a year, I think we earned from a $0 um, advertising budget to something like $100, $120 million a year, right? Because we'd figure it out. And every month, we're like, oh, I think we can spend a little bit more. And every month, we'd go, oh, I think we can spend a little bit more. And it was just phenomenal in terms of trying to figure it out. But, you know, we really challenged convention, I think, is, is maybe the lesson for entrepreneurs out there, right? One was, you know, that you have to go and spend half a million dollars to go and, and do these, you know, wild productions. Um, but two, sort of the unconventional way that we, you know, even the media, like we spent, a, you know, a $50, $75 spot and we learned so much from it versus buying, you know, national television platforms. So, we really kind of were scrappy in that, and it worked out really well for us. Yeah, no, I I, I think it's super. I, you know, at first you're like, we don't have a million dollars to run this, so you you run the program for a thousand dollars. You discover it works, and then you figure out how to actually spend a hundred and twenty million dollars a year doing it. And what's remarkable about it too is when you scaled up the program, is the extent to which it really did not increase CAC that much. So how much did kind of I think you said like from one to maybe like three dollars, despite you know orders of magnitude in increases in the budget. Yeah, in the first year, that's right. I think we probably went from you know one box, one buck to yeah three bucks, four bucks, and we raised our Series B along the way. And that Series B was really about you know the media dollars and really accelerating that flywheel. But that's exactly what we did, and you know how we were able to achieve it. But it was pretty powerful. And, and the key here was we figured out unit economics. So. That really meant that our payback here was really great, right? Yep. The $5 million that we spent the prior month, you know, it was kind of, you'd make two and a half back the next month and you'd make another two and a half back the following month. So you could cycle through the capital pretty quickly, which made it really efficient. Yep. So uh, that was the very beginning of us, you know, people. And by the way, you know, this is in 2011, 2012. We started the business in 2008. We, we, well, we founded in seven, we launched in eight. So you're kind of really going along at a very low trajectory, and then you hit this inflection point of growth. Um, but to your point about you know overnight successes, we've been on this you know journey for 15 years. But even at that point, we had been on the journey for five years, right? Yeah. Before we really hit the inflection. Yeah, and I, well, I thought you said something else interesting about that commercial, which was if it looked like later commercials we'd run, we might never have actually gotten into this category. So what happened was we ran some subsequent commercials. They actually didn't have the same impact. They didn't have the same lift that the first commercial had. So it was, you know, I, I think the note here is about perseverance, right? Like we got really lucky. Um, I don't know if we didn't get that lucky. Would we have the same tenacity? Like, would we have tested five other commercials? Would we have tried other networks? Yep. We might not have, right? So, you know, the courage of your conviction sometimes and really... Some, it, you know, luck goes into a lot of things, but we really quickly figured out that there's a formula that really matters. And we figured out that formula of what worked. But yeah, commercials two and three and four, not that great. Um, you know, five and six got a lot better because we figured out that's when it really tapped the anxiety or sort of the frustration of consumers that made people want to latch onto credit karma. Yeah. And as a special treat, we have as kind of a key artifact. Um, that ad that was the beginning of their uh, television marketing campaign. Honey, what day is it? The 14th. Why? Oh, we forgot to cancel our subscription to that free credit score site. So we just got charged $20. You know that's not free, right? 
free should actually mean free. Creditkarma.com offers truly free credit scores. Check your score as much as you want for free. No credit card needed and nothing to cancel. Honey, what day is it? You've got to be kidding me. Get your truly free credit score at creditkarma.com today, where free is always free. By the way, there must have been some expensive pens if you spent $20 on uh, <laughs> <laughs> on the, I think on the I had a couple of calendars. We bought <laughs> multiple calendars to be written on. That, oh, was, okay, the, yeah. that was the we cost. Had, you had to the test product. it out and see which ones, you know, really, That's really right. good. Um, cool. So... Next thing I want to talk about, you know, you can't provide free credit scores uh, without actually paying someone to get the credit scores, which means partnering with the bureaus. Uh, And, you know, one of the kind of perennial truths in fintechs is that there are usually these gatekeepers in the forms of regulators or kind of key industry players who you have to go and get access to. And the terrifying thing is they can turn you off overnight. So we'd love to hear about getting the first partnership live. And then we can talk about chapter two, which is like, when that live partnership almost died. <laughs> All right, well, getting the partnership live. So that was kind of fun. So we'll go chapter one. So, you know, we spent our first year in stealth, which really means nobody really cared what you did, but if we were just working head down. And, you know, one of the first things you got to do is you got to procure the data. So we went to the bureaus and we talked to each of the bureaus and we'd say, hey, we had this idea, you know, we're going to give the score away for free. We think, we, you know, we can help consumer side of better marketing products or financial products from it. And uh, that's the model. And what was interesting was every single one of those bureaus said, no, nah, we're not taking on new customers. <laughs> like, what do you mean you're not taking on new customers? <laughs> like, isn't that you're, your job? You're, to take you're, on, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're, you're almost like a public utility. What do you mean you're not taking on new customers? I have like half a million dollars in the bank. Um, but, you know, like if someone's going to say no, like, what do you really do? There's not a lot of recourse. And, um, you know, prior to uh, Credit Karma, I worked at this company called Elon, and Elon was an online mortgage company. And I reached out to our TransUnion rep and I said to him, Hey, you know, I've got this idea. We're trying to get access to credit scores. Can you help me? He's like, I think so. So, you know, we filled out the application, you know, and uh, submitted it. And I think, you know, whatever, a month, month and a half later, we got an approval, we got, you know, our subscriber ID, the credentials that we needed to be on uh, their development environment. And we spent the better part of uh, the year coding against that particular API. So we felt like, hey, problem solved, wasn't easy. It took a long time, it was certainly frustrating, but, you know, problem solved, let's move on to the next problem. So that was chapter one. But then fast forward, chapter two, a beach in Thailand, explosive growth, <laughs> near-death experience for the company. Yeah, so um, so chapter two. So we're building the business. Um, we spent about a year, 14 months or so getting to public beta. And I felt like, okay, public beta is probably a good time for me to go take a little vacation. Um, you know, my wife is Thai. We're like, let's go to Thailand. And this is 2008. It's February, 2008. I have a lot of these dates in my mind <laughs> that are significant. So, uh, you know, we, we got into public beta, which really meant that you had to have the code to get onto the site. Um, really we're just letting our friends and family test it. Right. Well, you know, I'm on the beach in Thailand and uh, Nicole, who's one of our co-founder calls was like, Hey, Ken, just want to give you the heads up that, um, their American banker has written a story about us kind of without our knowledge about the business model that we were doing and that we are giving away free credit scores. And but well, American banker is a trade publication. It's really for mortgage bankers. No big deal. It's not subscription really dated for the most part yeah. too. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So who really cares? Right. So I go back to my vacation. No big deal. Um, so I'm coming back from Thailand, and I remember this flight is, I think at the time, one of the longest flights in the world. So I think it's about a 16, 17-hour flight. So I'm on this flight, don't think anything, land in LAX. Well, at, back at the time, I would get a literal email for every registration that, I got, that, that we would have on the site. I land, and I turn on my phone, and now I have internet for the first time after like two weeks, right? And I get like <laughs> this, like, da, 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 like I get like 6,000 emails. Um, and I call, you know, I call Nicole, I'm like, 
what happened? You know, like, how did we get all this, these registrations? Like, well, you're on the plane, Ken, but while you were on the plane, we made it to the front page of Slick Deals and people had put up the telefriend code. So it became what would be viral right today. And, yep. You know, we basically started averaging like, you know, five, six, 7,000 users a day. And then over the next two days or so, just felt like you're on top of the earth, right? Like you, you feel like you have product market fit. You've got a bunch of traction. You got all these users. It's becoming slightly viral, and that their friends are telling their other friends the yep. codes out there. So you're feeling really great, and you're kind of like, all right, you feel like you're on to something. So probably two or three days after that, you know, you'll knock on the door, <laughs> and the knock on the door. It's a FedEx, right? And it's unexpected FedExes. And by the way, we don't get a lot of FedExes. So the FedEx is a termination notice. So the backdrop of this termination notice that we got from the Bureau was, hey, we got your application. We read it. We don't like your business model. And we didn't really read the application. <laughs> so, you know, we can't do anything. But the only thing we can do is we have a right of termination, right? So we're going to exercise that right of termination. Um, and um, so you've got 30 days before we turn off the lights. Um, so immediately from this moment of feeling like, wow, we really built this great ser you know, service and product that people love to, oh, my God, like 30 days, we're going to be out of business. And remember, the other two bureaus that wanted like nothing to do with us, right? Yeah. So I think for 28 days, uh, no, no, 22 days, I think there are eight days left before we had the meeting, um, we scrambled to figure out like who made the decision, like who do I have to talk to? Yep. So somebody gave me an email address. They said, I think this is the person you want to talk to. So cold email, send them an email like, hey, my name's Ken. I, I started this company, Credit Karma. Um, I think we're really on to something. I think we could work out a deal. You know, can we please meet on the phone on a call? And uh, surprisingly, I got a response back that was like, hey, Ken, I'm going to be in San Francisco in a couple of days. Why don't we go meet for breakfast? Yep. And who was this individual? Uh, this is John Danaher. We've become amazing friends. He's been an amazing partner. So, um, you know, great things come out of this story. Uh, but, you know, he's like, let's go meet for breakfast. Um, I remember the night before. Uh, that meeting, I, I got literally not a minute of sleep, right? I, I just felt like it was going to be the biggest meeting and everything that we'd been working on over the course of the last 14, minute, uh, 14 months is really going to hinge on how well this meeting goes. So we had breakfast and, you know, my pitch to him was really, look, we've got all this momentum, you know, at this point, I don't know how many users we've got, but probably some tens of thousands because of the slick deals piece. I'm like, we're clearly on to something. This is something you wouldn't build yourself. We've, you know, we're a small tech team. We're able to do this. Like you should really allow us to continue to move forward. And, you know, he's like, all right, I'll tell you what, we, we'll do it. But we want equity in this company, right? Was, was the deal. And I said, well, if you're going to get equity, like this $3 is, you know, whatever, $3 <laughs> is way too much. And we want some exclusivity and we want, you know, some ongoing uh, get going exclusivity rights. And so we negotiate a deal, takes us a month of paper, but he said, we'll keep the lights on uh, until then. And uh, that's how we struck the deal. And, and it's interesting in hindsight, like the economics would have broken for us and we would have run out of money. And, you know, uh, given what we talked about, the Great Recession, I'm not sure we would have weathered through it because... Obviously, we would have been burning so much capital if we were paying, you know, rate cards. Yep. So yep. it was really a blessing in disguise. And, um, you know, it allowed us to get through it. It allowed us to build a really strong partnership with TransUnion once we're able. But, you know, I often talk a lot, you know, sometimes forgiveness is a little, you know, better than permission. In this particular case, is a little bit of like, well, the traction allowed us to sort of, you know, get forgiveness, uh, forgiveness down the line in the form of like, yeah, we, it got us this, the, 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 the numbers and like the, the credibility we needed to build a bigger, stronger partnership. Yeah. And as you're talking about like, you know, the highs in entrepreneurship, very high, the lows, very low. And the delta in time between the two can be surprisingly short. Two days, two days, yeah. in this case. maybe three days. Right. I mean, it was insane. 
Yeah, yeah. You went from fastest growth, almost shut down, to actually inking a new partnership with a key partner that reduced your, you know, cost by like ninety percent, um, which to your point was very material to the business. So you would have had different issues had actually that conversation not happened um, at some point in time. So, so yeah, it's uh, it's always crazy to hear stories like that. Um, I want to kind of go on and talk about one of the next milestones for the company, um, which is, of course, the exit and every and the sale uh, to uh, into it. You know, every deal is is fraught and has its own, um, you know, hair on it. But I want you to talk through what was your experience given, um, you know, February 24th is was a was a big day for you. So maybe just start there. What was going on on February 4, 24th, 2020? Yeah, so February 24th was the day that we were going to announce the deal. You woke up as a board, you know, we were up literally the morning at five o'clock. And that's the morning that the Dow futures were down about 600 points because COVID was really starting to come into focus. And this was the first time that it spooked the markets. And the futures are down like 600 points, right? So like this is going to be a massively bad day for the market. And we're up 90 minutes in advance of the market opening uh, to vote on this deal, which is going to be announced in the public market. And keep in mind, we're getting half stock in the deal, right? So we're like, wait a minute, (laughs) everything's indexed. And um, is this the right moment? But, uh, you know, as, as, uh, as challenging as that moment was, we like, hey, you know what? We spent the time. Um, This is a moment in time. You know, this is for the long term. So. We got, we announced the deal, but, you know, that was a stark moment for us. And, uh, you know, we kind of like looked down the, you know, the barrel and we're like, all right, we're going to do this. Yep. Yeah. You, you announced the deal in the yeah. face of like kind of one of the biggest existential risks, like, you know, in a quite a long time, but <laughs> you're about to get into like announcing a deal is actually just the beginning of a long journey. Yes. So this is a complicated deal. So the deal is announced and. But the deal can't close till a bunch of process happens. And one of these processes for us is a DOJ review, right? Antitrust review, because Intuit is big enough, we're big enough that they do a review. Well, the problem with that is you don't know how long that review is going to take. So what you do customarily in the paper is you say, well, from the time you agree to the time you close, Credit Karma has these covenants, right? And our covenants are we're going to operate in a reasonable manner. We're going to do what we've always done. We're not going to hoard cash. We're not going to be drunken sailors with cash. We're just going to operate. And when you're signing, you're like, that makes sense. We have no intention of doing anything differently than what we normally do, right? So, of course. So, when you sign it, you don't really think about it because you have every intention of fulfilling on that. Well, the challenge is no one sees COVID coming. So, we sign on February 24th. And if you remember COVID, that was roughly the first week of March, right? That was the everyone go home. We don't know what this thing is, but we're gonna have everyone go home. But then, you know, April comes along and then May comes along. And the context of those months are, you know, what I can't remember our revenue numbers, but they drop a lot. You know, I want to yep. say they drop from, you know, maybe a hundred million dollars a month to 50, right? Like you're all of a sudden like profitable to burning a lot of money. <laughs> yep. And you you know, you don't know how long that, that's going to last. And now you're in this really And interesting- this is before the fundraising markets had kicked back off and you can't make changes to the structure of the capitalization of the business anyways and all of that. That's right. That's right. No one's funding it. No, no one's doing it. I mean, no, you can't call a VC. Like there's no one to talk to, right? Yeah. And what I'm getting, you know, from the board is like, hey, Ken, um, <laughs> you, you should lay off everyone. <laughs> You know, you got to be really careful. You're going to run out of money. Um, you need to really manage your burn. You have no idea when the market is going to come back. Um, so, and by the way, you should not think that um, Intuit is going to close this deal, right? Because there's no way they're going to close this deal. Like, and then on the other side of the whispers in my ears, you know, I call Sasan, who's the CEO of Intuit. And I'm like, hey, my board doesn't really think this thing is going to happen. And I don't know what exactly to do. And we and we can't even close this thing because we've got the government who's reviewing it, and we can't tell if they're going to take you know one month or ten months, right, or or, yeah. or eighteen months, right? Quite honestly, so you know he's like, Ken, we are a company of integrity. We follow through on what we say. Um, 
this thing is going to close, right? So I've got like these two extremes of like, well, if I just get through the other side, it won't matter. You know, the other side of that is like, you might never get to the other side, in which case you'll run out of money and the business yeah. will go out during. And laying off employees could jeopardize the deal because one of the things they're acquiring is the talent. And so that that's right. And then, you know, keep in mind, like, you're going to operate the business, uh, you know, as you normally would. And obviously that you're not operating as you normally would. Your revenues just dropped in material way. So it's a really challenging moment for us. And we did the best that we could in terms of leading through it. You know, we we took uh, pay cuts. Uh, we talked to the whole team. We reassigned people. We're like, hey, we don't need any recruiters right now. But if you want to be a program manager and learn a new career, we're going to focus on building a product. You know, we we focused, we rallied around um, Project Relief, which was, um, you know, we were organizing all of the debt um, relief programs that the government and the states and the mm -hmm. forbearance programs. And the good news is it really helped us on the engagement. So it felt good that we were doing something. But we led through all of that. Uh, um, you know, revenues came back, um, the DOJ got through their review and uh, into it, you know, much to their integrity and their word, uh, closed the deal when the DOJ got through it and we got to the other side of it. But uh, it was uh, it was a harrowing process. Yeah, everything down, down 600 points the day it's announced, revenues down, you know, 50% over the next few months. Facing the prospects of layoffs, you don't have to lay off anyone, though you do have to do material restructuring, the compensation and moving employees. But yeah, then the the deal gets done and it happens. Um, but you guys, you have come through um, COVID quite strong and inside of Intuit, you've still been building and shipping and growing. Uh, and the metrics you guys have been putting out and the contributions making there are super impressive. Um, maybe just to kind of close out on the Credit Karma story, talk to us about you know, what's what's next for Credit Karma in terms of what you guys plan to be building out and what the product roadmap looks like? Yeah, I mean, I think the great thing about, you know, both Intuit and, and really the vision is there's a strong alignment around in that vision. And, you know, and, and I think what people miss about Credit Karma is really what we're trying to do. You know, our point of view is that, a, you know, a consumer's financial life is very disparate. Uh, the, the, the silos, the product are somewhat um, blind to the other ones, right? Like my checking account doesn't know how much my credit card account has. What we think Credit Karma can really do is piece those things together, create awareness around it, but then also start automating the processes, right? We're going to help you manage your financial life in a way that um, really feels like it's in control so you can achieve the goals that you want. So uh, we're really excited about that. And, you know, when you think about the synergies between Intuit and the fact that, wow, they have $100 billion of you know, tax returns each year. They have another $200 billion worth of payroll. And all of those dollars are really kind of flowing into financial institutions that aren't necessarily optimized. We can optimize. I think we can get consumers into you know, a much better spot. And that's uh, what we're focused on. Yeah, totally. Just things like tax refunds. And to your point, you know, payroll, like having access, not that from just a, just a distribution standpoint, but just an ability to tie in and do automations that are super material. That's right. Um, cool. Now, that's super exciting. I think automation is one of the big kind of hopes for the future of, you know, what's next in financial services for consumers. And then to wrap things up, you know, we have a lot of founders and prospective founders in the audience. So what advice would you have for prospective uh, or current fintech entrepreneurs? Oh gosh. Well, we try to you know interlace them throughout uh, a little bit of the war stories. But you know, I always <laughs> say about this is like, you know, as a found, it's it's a hard journey, and you know, I always say like your job is to keep keep the team in the game, right? Like one more pitch, one more at that. That is the job, and you know, it's a long journey, but don't give up, right? Like this is this is this is a role that never feels good in the sense that you're always alone or oftentimes alone. Um, but you know, hopefully we've demonstrated a little bit of, you just, you just got to find a way. And when you do that, great things can come. So be passionate about what you do. Keep finding a way. Yep. Nope. Keep, keep on pushing through. Well, Ken, thank you so much for coming out. This has been an absolute pleasure and, um, just really great stories to, to think through. So thanks for spending some time with us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.